COVID-19 has caused significant disruption to working capital and cash flow. And how has it done that? Well, it's done it in many ways. First of all, we've seen a decline in certainly in current sales in the hospitality, tourism and leisure industry, but also an expected decline in future sales in the short to medium term. Issues with debtor collection, a reduction in suppliers' credit. We've seen an increase in costs for certain materials due to supply restrictions and supply issues. We've seen or we're anticipating an increase in costs to facilitate meeting social uh, distancing requirements. Uh, where relevant, foreign exchange rates volatility, uh, delays in receiving grants and support, to, though I think to be fair to the Northern Ireland Executive and the UK Government, I think overall they've done exceptionally well in this area. And we've seen also impacts on suppliers, credit terms, and finally stock holding. And I know some people within the tourism sector, I think we talked about this last week, are now finding that some of their stock is becoming obsolete and they're having to uh, destroy it. Basically, we're hoping that through this seminar, we, we leave you with at least one or two tips that you can take and apply in your own work environment. Uh, and hopefully it'll be particularly relevant over the next six to 12 months to help ensure that your business is protected and able to recover quickly post the pandemic. And hopefully will ensure that you'll only borrow what you require and you're able to service. Because albeit that it's great that people are willing to provide you bank finance, remember you have to pay it back. Uh, it will help you honour hopefully your commitments to suppliers and employees and it will assist you in planning in the right direction in terms of uh, identifying the most appropriate form of various government backed lending and supports available. And it's certainly useful, may I suggest to you, that you plan various scenarios because I think as we said last week, none of us can forecast the future with any certainty, certainly in the current circumstances, we could be all be billionaires, never mind millionaires. And uh, so it's always good to look at a few scenarios when you're, when, you're, when you're planning. So what do we hope to achieve by today's seminar? Well, very simply, we hope that uh, by the end, you'll have a greater understanding of working capital and working capital management, that you, you'll appreciate that it's cash for business more than profit, which is key. Uh, you can be a profitable business, but you can go out of business because you've no cash. Um, warning signs and practical strategies and tips to improve working capital management and cash flow. The two are interlinked. And finally, we're going to actually provide hopefully an opportunity for you to observe tracking and management of cash flow, including cash flow forecasts and what we call the, the four R's reporting, robust, rigorous and regular, uh, and regular reporting to, to, to ensure the business's competitiveness and survival. And one of the things that certainly COVID-19 has highlighted and is highlighting, if we haven't picked it up, is the importance of up-to-date quality management information. So very briefly, I don't plan, my slides will be available afterwards, so uh, some of my slides I, I plan to go over quite quickly, but just to make sure we have an understanding of what working capital is, it's the capital of the business which is used day to day in, in the training of the business. And it's basically calculated as your current assets, which are your assets, that have an economic life less than one year and your current liabilities, which are your liabilities that are expected uh, to, to arise within 12 months. Working capital management then refers to the business managerial accounting strategy designed to monitor and utilize the two components of working capital, current assets and current liabilities, to ensure the most financially efficient operation for your business. And finally, yes, you set goals for operations and in order to make productive use of limited resources. And finally, what is it all about? Well, the desired outcome is a good working capital process, which will mean less time spent hopefully by you and your admin team on administration and processing, thus freeing up senior management to focus on the strategic business issues. That's working on the business rather than in the business. Now, there's a number of factors affecting working capital. I'm not really going to focus on the internal ones, which obviously will vary depending on the size and nature of the business. But the external ones, obviously, we've already referred to COVID-19, but the economy, and obviously in the short term, it looks as if we're going to have very challenging economic circumstances. And other factors like banking services, new technology, new products, Brexit, don't forget Brexit, and competitors will all impact uh, uh, in terms of influencing working capital. So improving the way you manage your working capital will make your business uh, more sustainable uh, and, and able to address economic uncertainty better. And it's fair to say that careful management of working capital, including benchmarking, which is very important, as we mean by benchmarking there, we mean comparing your business with similar businesses to your own in the same sector, will be critical as your business prepares for Brexit. 
Improving working capital will build resilience within your business, as we talked about in our first seminar. And practical strategies to improve working capital will include your, how you manage your customers and your client relationships and stock and work in progress. And finally, you know, there are some options that, again, it depends on the nature of your business. If your business is all cash sales, this wouldn't be appropriate. But if you're involved in, in trade, trade sales, then, for example, in some instances, sales credit and insurance would be appropriate or fee finance or invoice discounting. And it's also important that you, you, con you consider, you know, effective tax and back planning uh, when, when we have to start paying our back again. Uh, when it comes, when it, when that comes back in. So it's important, VAT and tax can be quite important actually in terms of cash flow planning. At the outset, I suppose it's important that we, first of all, we hear people talk all the time about profit and loss accounts and balance sheets and cash flow statements. And it's important to appreciate that actually each of them are separate. Um, uh, and, and really a balance sheet I, I'll touch because I'm going to talk about the other two, but a balance sheet is a statement at a point in time at a particular date, it's simply a statement of your estimated assets and liabilities at that date. Uh, but if I got a pound for every time somebody said to me, are you sure I made a profit? Whenever I said to them, maybe you, you have a tax bill or something, I don't think I made it, I have no money. I have less money now than I had at the start of the year. And that's because there's a clear dis differentiation between profit and cash, and it's important we appreciate that. It's important that we understand the difference. Profit, not cash, Profit is the difference between the total amount your business earns and all of its all of its costs assessed over a period, which is normally a year or other trading period. On the other hand, cash is the amount you have on hand today in your pocket, in your till, to pay your debts. And you can be showing a very good profit on the books and still be stopped to count to have cash to cover your liabilities as they fall due. And you know, particularly your debt with our fixed liabilities. And uh, the bottom line is. We've all seen, unfortunately, good businesses go bust, which were making profits because they had very poor cash flow management. So working cash and capital management is the key to cash flow. And I thought to highlight this, I just share with you two companies, company A and company B. And again, my slides will be available afterwards. So uh, I'm gonna go through these reasonably quick, but feel free to look at them or give me a ring later. Both companies have sales of 100,000. Uh, they both believe or not have cost of sales which would be materials and labor in this case of 80,000. And they're both making a profit of 20,000. But let's look at their working capital management. Company A, as you can see, uh, oh, sorry, all the sales are trade sales, no cash sales. Company A, as you can see here, basically, uh, they have actually, um, their debtors, their receivables have paid them 40,000 and they're still owed 60,000. And in terms of their creditors, that's their suppliers, um, they currently have paid uh, 30,000 of those and they still owe 50,000. And as a result, the net assets, both, both businesses at the start and the, and the end of the two key, of the case studies here, net assets of 20,000. And, uh, but you'll see the bank position of company A, they are 10,000 pounds in the positive. But so let's look at company B. Same sales, same cost of sales, same profit, same net assets. Unfortunately, however, they have actually, in terms of their receivables, only 20,000 pounds of their 100,000 sales have been paid at the stage. They're still owed 80,000 from debtors. And in respect of their creditors, their cost of sales, they've actually, um, you can see they've actually paid 50,000, so they only now owe their suppliers 30,000. And believe it or not, the adverse movement in these two situations is a 40,000 pound difference in cash flow. In, in company A, company A doing the same business, same sector, same turnover, same cost of sales, they have 10,000 pound in the bank and company B have a 30,000 pound order. So that's why cash flow, you can see how fundamental is. They say it's the blood of the business, very maybe appropriate in our current health circumstances. And uh, as we've said already, quality internal management information, cash flow forecasts are key. And if you think about it, we've got to try and move from focusing on what credit the bank uh, will provide business to perhaps generating cash within our own resources. The more we can reduce our dependence, and I don't think the banks will mind me saying this, on banks, the better. Uh, so businesses should endeavor, if at all possible, and currently, to be honest with you, just at this moment in time, it's very difficult. But they should ultimately be trying, as part of their sustainable model again going forward, is to, it will be to, come, to become self-sufficient from a working capital perspective. 
We've already talked about the four hours, and it's fair to say that self-discipline and good management will yield positive results by improving profitability and reducing risks. And again, we'll share some examples later on. So when we say working capital, and that's a term you hear we talking about, what do they really mean? Well, in very simple terms, the working capital cycle absorbs cash. And there are only three issues that, that you can put thousands of things into, people give you different, but there's only three core points. One is your debtors. Uh, if you can get money in from debtors, it improves it. If you can't, if your debtor days get longer and longer, you have a problem. Uh, the other is your creditors. If you can extend credit within reason, all the better. And believe it or not, one of the most important ones to keep an eye on, particularly in the current situation, is stock and work in progress. Stock basically is a very costly item. And the faster you can turn stock over, the better. Because actually it means you're not hoarding up cash resources and stock sitting at the back. And finally, linked into stock or inventory is work in progress. And that would be relevant mainly to a service industry, although it would also be relevant where you are within the tourism, uh, hospitality and that you're actually producing a product that takes maybe a few days or a weeks week to ultimately produce. So in terms of working capital, we've already said it's current assets. They're, they're, those are assets which are held for a short period of time. Ideally, they say less than one year. Uh, and they're certainly expected to be converted into cash within one year. So if somebody owes you money for four years, it's not a current asset. That's a long-term asset. Similarly, in terms of current, uh, and the reason why it's a long-term asset is it's not available for you to meet your short-term obligations because you're not going to get paid it for a few years. And obviously, debts that are due to outside parties, but they're due within one year, they're all current liabilities. Now, we're not gonna, I'm not going to bore you this because I'm sure most of you will know this, but examples, you have obviously debtors and stocks, but an interesting one is prepaid expenses. Expenses you pay in advance. You know, if you pay for a full year and you're only two months into the year, then you have a prepaid expense. If you paid £1,200 for the year, you then have a prepaid asset of, believe it or not, £1,000 because actually, although you paid £1,200, you still have the benefit of a prepaid expense of 1000 And obviously, bank and cash balances form part of current assets. Instead, in, in terms of current liabilities, the trade credits we referred to earlier, obviously all the various taxes, your bank overdrafts, your bank loans, your leases and your HP, etc. So these three components all come together to, to give you what cash flow is. And cash flow is cash in hand at the beginning of any period, the money you receive and spent during an insuring period, and the cash then you have remaining at the end of the period. You can see yourself from this slide, and I don't plan to go into it, the various forms of what is cash and what is not cash. And the most important thing is probably the last one. Always remember and convince staff, certainly in the game I'm in, very important in my business, that you convince staff that work in progress is worth nothing. And in my experience, work in progress gets is worth less over time. So the shorter period you can reduce your work in progress to and convert it into a sale and get paid for it, the better it is for cash flow. And actually, I believe it's also the better for profitability in most cases. So it's basically cash flow management then, it's basically, if you think about it, is speeding up the inflows and slowing down the outflows of cash. And income and expenditure cash flows rarely coincide, but you must always be in a position to meet your scheduled payments. As I said, if you can't, you go bust. So that's why yeah, this is so important. And this means there can be times when you could not simply not have enough ready cash to meet your commitments. So what we've already been saying is summarized very briefly in this diagram. Your cash reservoir is your cash coming in, which is coming in from your accounts receivable, from uh, people paying you for, for service or product you've delivered, or alternatively from your own money or borrowing capacity you've got from some third party. And then the bottom underneath the cash reservoir is the various uh, applications of your money, what you're doing, it, whether it be manufacturing stock, whether it be uh, paying tax, buying new plant equipment, uh, paying for operating expenses, paying unfortunately bank interest or other times of financial interest, or paying yourself drawings or in the case of a company dividends. So the source of cash flow problems, let's think very quickly, how do they come? Well, we've all experienced it in the last few weeks. Collapse of the economy, such as COVID-19 has had such an impact on so many businesses. Insufficient funding, unplanned growth, poor credit control, really, there's no excuse for that. And once clients or customers get to know you're into poor credit control, they'll abuse it and they'll exploit you. 
International trading problems, which can be an issue, and we're not really going to focus on too much today, are under trading. That's where we are at present. In many cases, we're not trading hardly at all. But believe not, equally over trading. And over trading is when you perhaps ex ex extend your business too quick, you grow too quick, that you haven't allowed for the funding of the working capital gap uh, in between. So proving cash flow, as I'm sure you picked up already, is managing all those things we talked about before. Uh, and we're going to cover them over the next uh, half hour or so. So the, effect, the effective steps, and to be fair, we covered one or two of these, and some of the slides, were, the two or three of the slides we used last week, because you can't in completeness look at any of these topics without incorporating some things that are common. So step one, obviously, is to establish your opening, your baseline position, your opening balance sheet, and then to look at your bank loans and your, your, your bank and loan statement and see where exactly you are, and make sure you reconcile them for any outstanding lodgements, et cetera, or checks. Or disbursements, debtor and credit listings, and ideally, to be fair, as we said last week, statements are the best because that's what the third party is saying on your own records. Then outline the priorities for future trading. What are your customer and supplier relationships? What are the business structures you're going to implement? What's, you know, how do you get your brand across it as a premium that people come and obviously cash flow? And then finally, investigate the support available. This is all before you start. And we talked about this last week. Remember, this was key to the whole center of last week, the various funding that's available to help you. And I suggest, to be honest with you, you discuss this with a combination of your accountant or indeed uh, if you're an Invest NI client or working with local uh, enterprise agents or indeed tourism and I, uh, and also perhaps hospitality. Also, don't be afraid to approach these people and develop relationships because they're all willing to help. And then you go about creating your cash flow forecasting, which is your inflows and outflows, which we did last week. And we'll cover it briefly again today. But most importantly, you don't leave it in the shelf. Disaster. You must have continuous monitoring of it and seeing what, why, how things going against plan, what's not going, and changing, being agile uh, to change uh, as circumstances change during the course of the plan. Now, we, we did this last week, and I, I don't want to, or Monday, I don't want to go into too much, but sufficient to say this is how important the cash flow for you. This cash flow forecast shows you that during COVID 19, there was a massive drain on cash. You can see it on the way down to minus 100,000. And by the way, that's forecast by April 21 to be back up at 30,000 positive. But it's not going to go into the black immediately. And this is why we're, a lot of us are having to seek various government supports for our businesses to help us through that period, always with the knowledge that we believe we will have a sustainable and a profitable business going forward. So again, we highlighted these last week. I'm not going into them today, but suffice to say that if you look at the slides when they go up, you'll probably get a better understanding of the issues uh, that should actually go into the cash flow. We'll talk about them briefly in a second. But uh, the, the most important thing is you first of all got to say what interval are you forecasting weekly or monthly? To be honest, in terms of most of the financial models, the easiest ones to operate are monthly. Um, You've got to familiarize yourself, and obviously Ashok, who's doing the questions later on today, but I know he's giving two workshops, uh, I think it's uh, next Monday, one for micro and one for SMEs, really workshops on how to operate uh, cash forecasting tools, and then they're limited to 12 people each time, and uh, I think one of them is already booked out, but if you, if you wish, uh, get in early and try and get a space. I can assure you this is an area that Ashok is extremely competent on and you can see his, uh, at present uh, this particular model is actually on the Tourism NI website. And you've got to then link your calculations and your assumptions and you can then keep amending them. But once you build up the model, you can then amend them very easily. And then you've basically got to divide your costs. You remember we talked last week between the operating, uh, which are the sales, the cost of sales, the wages, the operating costs, the financing, which is your various finance costs, including interest in your loan repayments, etc., And then investing, if you're investing in capital expenditure. And obviously R&D would be another area there. So how do we forecast? Well, then you divide your costs. And, and again, think about this. Costs that are fixed are costs basically that do not do not change irrespective of whether you have any activity or not. Uh, they, they could be, for example, core light and heat, some equipment that must stay on all the time. Uh, there could be core uh, policies for staff, income protection or group schemes for, for staff. Uh, and then you have what's called variable, and they're very easy. They are costs that you only incur if you sell something. So the cost of selling, direct wages, direct costs, material inputs of the output you're selling. And finally, you have some costs that are semi-variable. And they are costs that basically, uh, they're, 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 they're fixed within certain steps. 
but they vary as, as you go to a step into another step. For example, you could require, uh, let's say, uh, three managers. But when you require those three managers, uh, you won't be at full capacity. And it could well be a couple of months or activity ways till you actually get up to full capacity. And then when you get to full capacity for those three managers, you have to go again. So there really was called a semi-variable cost because you have to put the full cost in even though you're not at the full utilization of the asset being there. But then again, you go to the next step and vice versa. So whenever you get to the end of fully utilizing a semi-variable cost, you're the most profitable. And then you've got to carefully consider the various mechanics of the working capital. And we're going to cover that again. I've covered it briefly in the outset, but we're going to go into it in more detail. And my honest advice to you is I believe professional help uh, is the cheapest thing you'll ever do, so long as it's the right professional help. And it's adding value to you and your business. So the three elements, I think we've highlighted those pretty well already. And uh, how you then measure debtors, creditors, and stock, a big work of progress or inventories. Um, how you measure those, your working capital percentage, which is very important from a benchmarking point of view. You simply add three debtors plus stock plus three creditors, the values of them, you put them over the value of your sales, and you multiply it by 100. And that gives you your working capital percentage. And if you can get any businesses, you know, uh, you can see accounts for maybe not, business, not bigger than your own, but they're still in the same sector. Go and work out their working capital percentage. Ignore the figures, the percentage, and compare it to yours and see if there are lessons you can learn. Now, when we say about debtors, you hear people regularly saying, oh, my debtor days are 40, or my debtor days are 60. This is for trade sales, not cash sales. And this is for cash sales you don't get paid for immediately. Um, and what that means is that means on average it takes you 40 or 60 days to get paid. And how you calculate that is whatever your trade debtors, the value is at a point in time, you put that over your total sales say for the period for a year uh, and you multiply it by 365. And that gives you then the average uh, time period in days it takes you to recover a trade uh, a trade sale to get paid for whenever you make a sale and raise an invoice, but you don't get paid there and then. And that tells you the amount of average days. Now, it's fair to say that um, uh, the best situation, and many, many businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector are good at this, is to try not to give credit at all and not get aid, sorry, there's a typo there, and get paid, get paid up front uh, if you can. And uh, good credit control is really, the truth is, it's all about systems, it's all about culture. And, you know, you think about it, if you go out then into trade sales, into data management, you can accelerate, if, if you can accelerate money due to you, by following a few simple steps to try and reduce your debtor days. And we'll pick up examples that you'd be amazed the impact this can have on your cash flow and to a lesser extent on your profitability. But it is important you agree the terms of doing business. You know, we said last week, if you don't have a destination, you'll never get there. Well, you know, if you all of a sudden you're doing business, but you have no terms of business, that's quite dangerous and can be exploited. Established credit practices as a matter of company policy. The worst thing is we've all been busy fools in the past, is to work your, your guts out to get a sale and then the bugger doesn't pay you. Well, put credit practices in place. You know, it may well be that you don't go ahead with a sale, but maybe you're better not having the sale to someone who's at risk of not paying you. You're better having less sales for people that's going to pay you than people that's at high risk of getting paid. Establish limits for each category and observe them. Do perhaps credit checks. I mean, ask key customers for credit references or go to credit agencies. Um, very, that's why sales credit insurance is very important. for credit. It, it actually provides that to you quite often. Don't be afraid to go and visit the, co the customer's premises if, if they're a significant customer. Um, obviously, ma monitor debt outstanding from each customer, particularly the larger ones. And if they're above the limit, don't extend any further product to them until they bring it back under the limit. I maintain regular contact with our clients. These are all quite simple, but we know ourselves in the ordinary day pressures of business, we can let them slip. Uh, you can consider charging interest in overdue accounts, but if you get it or not, you'll be very lucky. I, I already see that one work. Uh, you certainly consider other options to help people pay, whether it be encouraging now, as most of us do, box payments, or even uh, allow people to pay by credit card, etc. Uh, and certainly offer early payment incentives. We've talked about it earlier, but I believe sales credit insurance, where the nature of the business is, is credit trade sales as opposed to cash sales, is very beneficial. Uh, and then you have obviously various other options to look at. Reservation of title is an interesting one. That's if you're supplying a product to somebody and you can, you can sell it on the basis that if they don't pay you, you can claim it back. Again, you need legal advice there and it doesn't always work in every situation. And the truth is, 
you don't really want to get into the next situation because it's very costly for you, both in terms of money and time. But you may start the process of issuing a written request for payment and then working out what you think it's going to cost you to collect the debt and maybe then go after and pursue the debt. Some telltale signs that, you know, from experience dealing with many businesses, these are the telltale signs. Quite often we let them go without noticing them. Weak credit judgment within your own business. Poor collection procedures. You're, you're that busy. You're not collecting the money due to you. You're not enforcing terms. Slow issue of invoices. You're issuing invoices at the end of the month instead of issuing them when the service or the product is delivered. And you're not issuing statements at all. Or if you're issuing nursing them a month late, let's get that tight. There's no, that's all internal. And really, there's no excuse for that not being tight. Uh, you have to be honest, one of the reasons why you may not be getting paid is customer isn't happy. And that's very, that's very important. Um, certainly in our own case, we brought in a rule about three years ago, we don't issue any invoice to the client agrees it. And that has transformed our business. We don't have any bad debts for it. Because people, we talk the invoice in advance, and if they agree it, then we issue it. Um, you have to make sure the people have the ability to pay you uh, and there are potential bad debt. Now, there's a few things to keep your eye out for because quite often it's amazing when our insolvency department goes in to look at a business. It's amazing how many of these common traits are there. Is somebody taking longer credit than they normally do? And they're maybe starting to make smaller orders rather than larger orders? The issue of post dated checks, think about this. Why does somebody give you a post dated check? The reason they give you a post dated check is they don't think they have sufficient cash now to pay you. That's fine, but that's a warning sign. The next one is really important. You know, have a wee look around at your competitors and see if the people that aren't maybe paying you that much and have a little bit of credit with you, that they're going to each of them. And it's amazing once we come in on an insolvency case, and maybe you do three or four in the same sector or the same area, you'll find they all have the same creditors. It's amazing. These creditors have just gone each business and got a small amount of credit from them all, and then unfortunately they went under and paid no amount. Look, if a customer is unwilling, if this is a significant trade customer and they're unwilling to give you a credit reference, you're better without them. Golden rule. You're better, you're better actually go and play golf. You can't, not, not in these circumstances, whenever it comes out. Go and play golf. Take the dog for a walk. Don't waste your time doing a product or a service you're not going to be paid for. You only fool yourself. And if people don't want to give you a credit reference, you have to ask yourself why. Uh, we had a client one time, um, and basically they had a golden rule. Even if it was family. If they didn't get a credit reference, they couldn't supply the product. And receiving around some payments is also tricky. If you find that some of your creditors are sending in £400 or £1,000 but not paying any specific invoice, that's a sign of limited cash and they're just trying to keep the wolf away from the door. Again, not a bad thing, but lift the phone and ring them and see if you can understand what's going on. Now moving on to creditors. These are your suppliers and the, again, the uh, uh, how long you take to pay something. How long you take to pay a creditor, you can calculate that in days by simply taking your creditors at the end of the year and divided by your raw material or your direct costs for the year, if you're a producer of product raw materials, purchasing raw materials, and you divide that by 365, and that gives you your creditor days. And again, the key to this is to look down at benchmarking. What are the sector norms uh, for your particular type of business? And again, there's wee basics you can get right. Uh, I looked at the business about eight weeks ago, and uh, to be honest with you, you all you had to do was walk around the place, and you'd have spotted everywhere I walked. Uh, I, for example, those post-its. I seen uh, the amount of post-its I seen sitting on the desk was phenomenal. And I simply said to the owner, "If you don't mind me, because it was quite obviously small, one of who authorizes your purchase?" I said, "Who ordered all those?" Oh, they just order themselves. That's not a really good idea. You're really better sitting down and deciding who has the authority to make purchases in the business and really narrow that down. Because actually there's nothing worse than you having to pay bills that you didn't even know in the first place the product or the service was, was ordered. Uh, yes, shop around for, for best value. Try to minimize inventory of stock. We'll come to that later. There's nothing more expensive. For example, if you were sitting with stock and COVID-19 came all of a sudden, unless it had a long, durable life, I'd say your control of the stock is worth knowing. Very important. Uh, can you arrange to get supply staggered? Obviously, it's another point. Maximizing credit terms within reason is important. Making prompt payments to get the benefit. If you have cash, make prompt payments to get the benefit. Uh, of cash discounts. 
also get the benefit of being having a really good supplier relationship. And the possibility of consignment stock, again, not that common in most businesses in the tourism sector, but it is in, in some, particularly in the, the uh, some of the, the retail elements of it. And what that is, that's basically where a supplier supplies you with stock, but technically speaking, you don't have to pay for it if you don't sell it. You give it back. And the possibility of reservation of title causes, we, that's just from the other side around, but we, we covered it earlier on. Stock and inventory. This is your stock and your inventory. And again, basically what this is, is, is very important. This is, this is your raw material or your unfinished products uh, which have not yet been sold. If they haven't been sold, you haven't converted them into any money. And again, how do you work them out? There's two different key ratios here. There's a stock turnover ratio. You may hear people saying, I turn over my stock four times a year, or 10 times a year, or 12. This is how they work it out. It's direct stock cost, direct purchase cost over the average stock at a point in time. And finally, then you can, similarly as you work out debtor days and creditor days, believe it or not, you can also work out inventory days, which is your stock value at the end over your direct cost of material for the year multiplied by 365. And that gives you the days, average days. That you hold stock in the year. Now, there are a number again of key factors to be looked at in terms of stock. I mean, projected sales levels, availability of raw material. I mean, can you get the material within a day? Or, or do you have to buy, say, three weeks in advance in order to guarantee you have it when you need it? Uh, that's where we talk about the lead time and suppliers. The length of your production process. To be honest with you, in many cases in the tourist and hospitality industry and leisure, the production process is quite a small cycle. But in some cases, it's not. And the efficiency of the distribution. I mean, things you can carry out, carry out regular stock takes. Certainly those of you who are in the, the bar or the, uh, the hotel business would know how important this is. And certainly you wouldn't be doing it just twice a year. You'd be doing it every week or every month. Uh, know the number of times each major item of stock turns. That's actually quite important because then that gives you a feel for your core areas and what, how often you need to order. And consider selling off outdated stock because I'll be upfront about it. And, and only in very rare circumstances, uh, <laughs> the slow moving stock regain value and you're really better getting it rid of it and taking some cash for it. You can th there's a number of things you can do. You can you consider having part of your product or service outsourced. That can reduce your impact on, on stock. It may impact your profitability a little bit, although in some cases outsourcing can even be cheaper than you doing it yourself. Um, you review your security arrangements to make sure uh, some of your staff aren't walking out the back door of your stock. And again, you do that through various things, not only just security, uh, analysis, management information, gross profit analysis, et cetera, looking wastage percentage. Uh, and again, you benchmark against yourself against other similar businesses, which is very important. And reduce stock where necessary can be very useful because obviously if you can implement a just-in-time policy, you just get the stock when you need it. That's particularly effective. Now, work on progress, which if you're in the service industry in particular, uh, within the tourism and hospitality and leisure centre, this is a really an important area to watch. And um, it's probably the key area in, in, in many service businesses. And you've got to endeavour to minimise work in progress in order to, 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 to fasten up the process of raising an invoice. If you think about it, you can't, if you haven't finished the job, you can't raise an invoice. If you can't raise an invoice, you can't get paid, even though some of your costs have been incurred maybe a month earlier. It's really important to, in this type of thing to focus on engagement terms and if you can't even put milestones, payment milestones in. And you know, converting work in progress into interim and final invoices is ultimately getting paid for the work you've done. Really important. Again, how do you work that up? There's a thing called lockup, which is very important if you're, if you're selling, in a, if you're in a business which focuses mainly on non-cash sales. And lockup basically is the number of days on average that you have debtors and work in progress within your business. And you, you calculate the lockup days by adding debtors and work in progress at a period end over your sales for the period and multiply it by 365. So it's fair to say if you're cost cutting, and I, I always encourage we all cost cutting, make sure you, cut, you, you make the cuts first of all from the fat and not the muscle of the business. Yes, it's important to cut a cost, cutting cost is essential, but it has to be done smartly. Do not impose arbitrary budget. Whenever I hear somebody say, well, we just took 20% off everything, that's a lazy, lazy way. You've got to look and see where should the cost be cut. And you know, it's, it's certainly relevant in overheads. You really got to keep an eye on overheads, particularly in the current environment we're about to go into as well going forward. Because it was very easy cutting them out now when we weren't trading because of COVID-19. But as we start to trade again, just keep an eye on overheads and have the courage to discontinue some costs if they're no longer consistent with your re-engineering business goals 
uh, going forward. Currency management, again, is one that uh, can, can, can influence some businesses in the sector, depending if they're purchasing from outside the UK or not, outside the sterling area. And simply allowing currency developments to take their course can seriously affect working capital and may mean your business is actually selling at a loss. So there are ways to get around this. There's hedging techniques we hedge receivables, expected receivables against expected payables. And uh, certainly uh, if you have a lot of customers in sterling euros or dollars or, or suppliers, it makes sense to, to, to put in place a foreign exchange currency management process. Now, I, I thought I would just um, show you a, a little short uh, case study again are very interesting in terms of working capital management. Uh, this this business basically, they had sales of a thousand, uh, sales of a million pounds. It's easy just to, to show it as an example the scale. They purchased a five hundred thousand, and their debtors were eighty days, and their creditors were seventy five days. Stock were fifty days. Now what happened here was there was a whole review of working capital because all of a sudden they were finding cash flow was getting very tight. So what they did was they put a major emphasis over a period of three to four months of actually trying to reduce their debtor days, really getting up tight, getting their invoices out in time, getting statements out, making phone calls, equally trying to see was there ways that they could make comment with suppliers always to push out the credit period they were getting from suppliers. And believe it or not, they reduced their, their stock, their inventory, stock and work in progress from an average of 50 days, which is hard if you think of it, that's a turnover about seven times a year. 50 days down to 30 days. And this was all done, believe it or not, this is a phenomenal achievement over about a four month period. And what actually, that, that this is good now, to, to reduce these in four months, quite often this will be a year process or two years, to reduce these in four months was a phenomenal achievement. But what impact did it have? The impact it had basically was that you can see debtors fell from 219,000 to 164, but the turnover was the same. Creditors went up a little bit, a little bit more credit, and stock levels fell because they reduced their stock inventory days from 50 to 30. They had a cash flow saving. Now remember, this is a turnover of 1 million. They had a cash flow saving of over 10% of turnover, 102,000. They had 102,000 more money in their bank account after than before this exercise. And believe it or not, at a bank interest rate, say, of 4%, that reduces the cost by, uh, the cost of doing business by just over 4,000. And if you think they're making a net profit percentage of 5%, I'm not actually doing this in your head, but you can do that on the calculator. If you actually assume that a net profit margin of 5%, in order normally to generate a net profit then of 4,110 pounds, they'd have to generate extra sales of 82,200 pounds. So very smart, not only working capital cash flow, but profitability. And uh, you can see, uh, it certainly pays to get your working cash, uh, capital management uh, right. So a few tips, just a few concluding stuff. Before you borrow, consider the following. In the short term, encourage payment of debtors by offering cash discounts. Ideally, encourage people to pay you cash up front. Uh, negotiate additional credit from suppliers if possible as part of your negotiations at the time. Reduce your raw materials or finished goods level and sell off slow moving stock. Uh, seek additional support from shareholders if you need. If you, if you just have a situation that the business is going through uh, serious cash flow problems. Reduce or defer even your own drawings or dividends. We all know there's times we've had to do that. Uh, defer capital expenditure in the short term only. You know, for example, if you need to expend money and technology to have a sustainable business going forward, I know some of our clients have actually upped their spending, even though the business is not focused, is not trading present, they've decided at this time to concentrate more on preparing for digitalization by investing really heavily. They've been lucky they've built up cash reserves over, over the last couple of weeks and they plan to do it even more happily over the next few months because they think uh, technology will be key to their sustainability and survival going forward. Perhaps lease rather than purchase equipment. And you know, if you remember what we said last week, always match the period of the debt with the expected economic life. Do not use short-term debt to fund a long-term asset. And if you have to go after external funding, which we talked about last week, give me your number. So some vital signs I think we, we, we talked about to keep an eye out for, uh, because they, they let you realize that there are problems ahead and you need to take corrective action. Falling sales, sales pipeline, which, is, which many of us experienced because of COVID. Uh, falling profit margin. If your profit margins are falling, there's a couple of things to watch there. You need to be careful. You're not selling at the expense of profit. You know, quite often that can also give rise to overtrading, by the way. Bad debts, you know, if your bad debts are increasing, you're maybe only fooling yourself. You think about 
yeah, you're making sales, but are you really checking out the ability of the people to pay you? Your debtor profile, we, that's basically trying to look at how, how, what percentage of your, of any individual represents a percentage of your total debtors, etc. and over what period of time. Uh, if, if your stock all of a sudden is not turning over too quick, that's a tricky one. Don't increase the value of your stock to show more increased profits. You're really bluffing yourself. And uh, if there's an increase in lockup days, that's debtors to stock. So they are all little signs. And uh, what then happens is there's an inability to pay your suppliers on time. You have increasing bank fees and charges because your bank debt's rising. You, you're, you basically, we're not talking about this period of deferral that we have at present back and, and revenue. We're talking now here about a, a business post-COVID and trying to trade out of COVID. Uh, you could have increasing uh, POIE or VAT liabilities, increasing the level of bank debt, difficulties in paying wages and director salaries, and you're unfortunately maybe ringing the bank or the bank's ringing you on a regular basis to say your, your checks are bouncing. So those are all things to do. However, there, there, there are ways, some practical tips, if, there, if all of a sudden, as some have happened in recent weeks, you've come to a situation where you have an inability to honor commitments. And the first thing to do is, my experience is if you speak to people in advance, very rarely will you not get a, an accommodative solution. Explore options in terms of restructuring your debt, or deferring it. Involve business advisors, certainly, to help you. And regular communication with creditors is very, very important. Reduce or, or even defer in the short term drawings. Uh, defer capital expenditure in the short term. Early decisive action. Don't keep putting off the way they do. Like I had a client, unfortunately, one time he got that bad, he wouldn't open the post coming in. All that was doing was making the problem worse and worse. And if necessary, it could be important to consider insolvency procedures. Because if that's required, the sooner you do it, the better. Because then potentially you could have more assets. Uh, for yourself at the end, or you will have it. Certainly, if you've given PGs, etc., you'll reduce your PG by bringing it to a head at an earlier stage. Thirdly, research the market in terms of advice. Perturb, we, we've already highlighted this. The terms of business very important. Credit terms very important. Uh, and the, the idea of considering payments in advance. Don't be afraid. If you think your product or service is so important, that's why people do ask now and again for deposits. For example, in weddings or somebody booking wedding function or whatever. Quite often you ask for the positive, somebody booking a large order, whether it be for a tourist facility or even for a restaurant or, or an hotel, quite often you'll ask maybe for an upfront uh, deposit. And seek legal advice that you need to, to either get the proper contracts in place or to enforce them. Um, I just want to, uh, have three or two or three minutes left, I just want to again highlight this, but I, I really I'd rather you go back to the later stage and look at the slides or look at the, uh, the video on the, on the Tourism and I website. But basically this was a professional services firm. Uh, could be quite similar to, to the tourism. And what happened basically was, you'll see here, they were a particularly fast growing business. Um, their turnover increased uh, from 4.2 million in 2016 to 7.6 million. It's a live case study, I was involved in it myself. Uh, in 2019, year ending 31 March 2019. Now, amazingly, what they did was four years ago, and this doesn't happen overnight, this is back to this culture we're talking about. They, start, they realized that if they were going to be able to fund their growth, they had to make significant improvements in working capital. And believe it or not, over the four year period, they reduced their debt. It is a phenomenal achievement. Put their sales up, you can see from 4.2 to 7.6, but reduced their debt. It is from 115 days to 54. What does that mean? Believe it or not, once they did that, whilst their turnover grew 2.37 million, 55.6%, their debtor days actually fell 40%, 46 days, it took them 40, on average, 46 less days to get paid. And that released, this is astonishing figures, this is a real life case study, that released 836,000 cash flow into the business. And that allowed the business to fund significant growth activity internally without going to external sources. Now, believe it or not, again, assuming a cost of capital of 4%, that would give them 33% extra net profit. And depending on what the net, if the net margin was say 10%, that equates to an extra 330,000 sales. So you can see, they also made very big progress in their work in progress. So really that was a dramatic change in culture. That didn't happen overnight. But these are the type of things in the current environment we're going into that you've got to be thinking of. What can I do in my business to make things happen? So if you're fortunate enough to have surplus cash, uh, Make sure you use it to, uh, to fund the current disruption period, to reduce borrowings and debt. This is a good time to negotiate with anybody who's extended credit to you as well to see if you can do a deal with them. Uh, and you know, in some cases, you're better ring-fancing some of this cash 
to protect it, the banking happens to the business, etc. And if that's the case, you need to talk to a trusted or an independent financial advisor. And one of the things I've been trying to highlight in today's presentation is the whole culture, the DNA within the organization. Everyone needs to be thinking working capital management, not just the MD and not just the finance or the, the credit control department. It has to be the entire operation and ensure that everyday conversations are used to drive continuous improvement in working capital management. We've all been there. There is nothing more frustration than the day you find out somebody's not going to pay you. You've got to try and mitigate those if possible. And, you know, are there key performance indicators? And there are. The truth is there are. I've given you some of the presentation, but there's others. To put in place whatever the nature key to your business, and the different from one business are, to help you measure the efficiency of your working capital management. And I believe that successful business, if I look at our business that are really successful, they're eating and sleeping working capital management. And what we're really saying is that, you know, if you share and talk about your organization's working capital and cash flow management and integrate these into personal goals from the people you're sitting alongside, it makes sense for two great reasons. Number one, we find that the more you talk about your goals, the more you become committed to them. And secondly, as you verbalize your goal to others, you gain more clarity yourself in your own mind of what you're really trying to achieve. And you think about it, with clarity comes certainty and with certainty comes confidence. And that transforms itself ultimately into business confidence, which clients and customers can see and pick up. So the act of talking about your working capital goals is powerful and profound. So my last slide, and I think I've concluded within time, but 45 minutes, I think I've just come in over. I just, to conclude, say five things. Cash is critical, but saving the business is even more important. So it's back to what we said even last week, it's balance. You have to get balance. Cash is key, but it's not the only thing. You've got to balance it and get the priorities of the business right. You need to shield your good ideas, your business structures, your relationships, your people and your brand. They all integrate. It's not as if you do one and don't do the other. And believe it or not, you'll find if you have a good brand, nine times out of 10, your cash management will be good because people will pay a premium for your brand and they'll be willing to pay for it earlier than they might otherwise be. Be agile, yeah, we all. If ever we've been talking the, talk the lesson and making sure we had agile strategies and agile businesses, it's the past eight weeks. Be agile and adapt quickly to change and technological enhancements and advantages. That's mainly where our agile uh, strategies have, have really been effective in the past. Obviously, unfortunately, COVID-19 has brought agility to a whole new level. And, uh, you know, I think it was Martin, Martin Luther King who said, the time is always right to do what is right. Personally, I would rather get on and take a decision and if it's wrong, go back and correct it than keep thinking and thinking and thinking it to try and get it right in the first place. There comes a time when decisive and not forgetting that key word, caring. Decisive and caring leadership is key ultimately to developing and delivering a sustainable business. I hope today's talk uh, has helped you somewhere in that journey.